everyone and welcome to today's Connect and Learn webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples listening today or in the future. My name is Rebecca and I'll be facilitating today's webinar, Psychological Safety and Window of Tolerance. This webinar is a part of a series, uh, the Connect and Learn webinars designed to support AOD clinicians throughout Victoria. The series is funded by the Victorian Department of Health and hosted by Turning Point. We do want our webinars to be interactive as possible, so we've set up a Q&A function, not the chat function. So any questions that you have throughout the presentation, please enter into the Q&A function. I'll collate them at the end for our presenter. And um, you know, unfortunately, we won't get to all the questions, but I'll do my best to put them into categories so Jen can kind of answer them as best she can. This webinar will be recorded and will be available later on the Turning Point website. Unfortunately, the slides will not be available, but again, you can watch it um, you know, from our website at any time. We encourage you to stay to the end of the webinar and complete the exit survey when the QR code appears uh, on the final slide. You'll also get that survey um, by email and we would really appreciate it if you could fill it out. I'd like to present our presenter, um, Jen Thompson. Uh, I'm sure a number of you have heard her speak before uh, and Jen, you know, we've got her back after doing um, some other presentations for us. Jen has 40 years experience of leadership in the not-for-profit sector and over 25 years in the alcohol, tobacco and other drugs sector in both residential rehabilitation and outpatient community health settings. Uh, her experience is broad and has included counselling, supervision, management and program director roles. Uh, welcome Jen and thank you so much for coming back. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Really good to be here and terrific to see such an interest in this topic. Uh, welcome everybody. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the custodians of the land and water where we meet today. I'm meeting you on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any community members with us today or following on with the replay. We're looking at uh, the window of tolerance today and we're also going to touch on polyvagal theory and how that aligns to this theory. And I'm going to invite you to keep a dual lens today. So uh, not just thinking of your clients here, but really applying everything that we're going to talk through today to both yourself and your clients. So the window of tolerance is all about resilience, all about that window of resilience. And we know that human beings have an incredible capacity for burden, for overcoming adversity, to be flexible and to uh, overcome difficult life experiences. But we also know that no matter how skilled or capable we are, we can't be resilient all the time. And that's never been more so than in this current uh, climate with the pandemic. We know that the pandemic has brought increased stress on a global scale, both to our clients that we work with, but also to the professional landscape. And professionals are juggling their personal and professional lives in a way that we never have before. It's affecting morale, uh, there's significant challenges, rapid changes, and the practice landscape has fundamentally changed for all of us. So the window of tolerance is a topic that we all need to have some good understanding about and also know how to apply it. What we know about the human body is that we have a tolerance. Uh, we are born with a bucket of vulnerability, whether that be our family system or the culture we were born into our ut in utero experience, a whole range of things impact their vulnerability that we are born into. And over our lifetime, we accumulate a whole lot of challenging life events that become body memory, become stored in our nervous system. And what we know about our nervous system is that it's constantly scanning the environment for safety or danger based on our life experience. So when there's prolonged stress or trauma, 
and inadequate support, our autonomic nervous system gets dysregulated or flooded, overwhelmed, and moves outside of the window of tolerance. So here, it's important to really appreciate this incredible system that we have and to know that stress and trauma is not a mental injury, it's stored in our biology, just as we've, we've talked about in the introduction to trauma and form care. So now more than ever, we need a bottom up, top down approach because our nervous system is a bi-directional communication system. There's a super highway uh, that is going from our brain stem, it's connecting to all of our major organs, our arms and legs and helping us to mobilize, but also when overwhelmed, moves into shutdown or freeze. So this uh, window of tolerance is all about respecting the intelligence and the wisdom of what I call mind body. So we don't have a separate mind and body, the mind body is connected and it's a bi-directional super highway of communication. So this is where the window of tolerance comes in. Here we have the window of tolerance. For all of us, we mostly know what it's like to live with this window of tolerance where we feel calm and occasionally our um, activation might take us to the top of the window. If we get frustrated or irritated, um, we may move down to the edges of the window when we feel sad or disappointed, we may have a flat or low mood, but we move up and down in a regular way within the window of tolerance. And this is particularly so when we have sufficient support. So what enables us to sustain uh, being in the window of tolerance is our capacity for support, how much support we have, what resources we have, what social support and internal skills we've learnt about. So when we get dysregulated, we actually move outside of the window of tolerance. So we can do this in the everyday. Most of us move outside of the window of tolerance if we need to assert ourselves, set a boundary with someone. We may feel that activation of energy that helps us to get into that flight fight um, activation. But when we get stuck there or when there is extreme flooding, then we start to experience in that dissociated or dysregulated state an impaired judgment in that state. We have emotional reactivity that's illogical, that doesn't make sense, that is loaded with panic or anger and we have dissociated rage in that state. We can equally move down to a freeze response. When we feel overwhelmed and feel that acting is not going to support us if we feel powerless, then we are more likely to have a low energy moving down to a dysregulated or dissociated state that is hypo arousal. Now, talking to many people in the sector, I see a lot of hypo arousal in the workforce because we've tried the fight flight, we've been in uh, rapid changes, adjusting, flexing, uh, working from home, doing all kinds of things that we need to do in this unprecedented time. And when we feel exhausted, we find that that exertion of energy is no longer available and we start to feel that sense of despair or hopelessness or absence of sensations. So we tend to, um, get stuck in that dissociated low energy state. So with our work with clients, our goal and with ourselves is to widen the window. So when we're working with people who have significant trauma history, if we think about the bucket of vulnerability, we think about the accumulation of life history in the nervous system and body memory, the window of tolerance might be really tiny. Uh, people may, we may experience that they're in hyperarousal most of the time or they're in hypoarousal dissociation most of the time. And this is where we see dissociative identity disorder and, and um, dissociation 
disorders are in that stuck hypoarousal state. So our goal, hopefully, over time, with lots of trust and relationship building and skill building, we, we hope to encourage our clients to widen their window of tolerance so that they have greater capacity to remain steady, calm, able to think and feel at the same time when they're under distress. What we know is if we avoid our dysregulation, if we avoid our anxiety, we push it down, um, we ignore what's happening in the body, we know that avoidance just creates greater and larger problems for us and dysregulation becomes amplified. So this image comes from Dan Siegel, um, a great cartoon that a lot of my clients really like where we're, our window of tolerance is like sailing between chaos and lucidity. And a lovely quote from John Breyer, who's a trauma specialist, has said that good treatment must honour and acknowledge the survivor's competing needs to maintain safety and internal stability while at the same time being open to experience and information so that they might heal and grow. So we know that this is true when people are talking about their trauma for the first time. There may be a lot of triggering in that, that, that flips them from chaos to rigidity and needing to pendulate or um, titrate. So if we think of a bottle of soft drink that we shake up um, as representing someone with a lot of trauma memory in their body, we're going to just very slowly open the lid and allow a little out at a time and titrate or pendulate in order for the person not to become overly dysregulated, but to find some safe place to land, um, some sense of flow that is calm and regulated and able to think and feel at the same time. So a traumatic event can trigger a stuck hyper-aroused experience or a stuck hypo-aroused experience. So someone can really be working well at regulating the ups and downs of life and then a traumatic event happens that uh, gets the accelerator on and moves us into hyper-arousal that gets stuck on where there's a sense of high energy, sleeplessness, irritability, hostility, restlessness, unable to relax. Um, in this state, we, we can understand that we have digestive problems and our body is actually um, literally stewing in its juice when we're in that hyper-aroused state. What we know about um, hyper-arousal is that over time, when we get stuck on hyperarousal, what happens is that we peter out of energy and the brakes come on and eventually we shut down. So what's underneath the accelerator is the, the brakes, the shutdown. So when we're in shutdown, um, we need to be mindful that when someone moves out of shutdown, they actually go through um, the sympathetic nervous system arousal. That's what's underneath the brakes. So it's like a revving of the system. The brakes are on, the accelerator's on at the same time. In the introduction to trauma-informed care, we um, looked at Dan Siegel's uh, prefrontal cortex uh, talk and the handy brain. So I won't labor on this because you can um, revisit that, that webinar or you can look at Dan Siegel's um, little video on the handy brain, but this is really helpful for clients to understand their own biology, to know that the nervous system is communicating with the limbic system and our amygdala. And when we're flooded or when our nervous system is dysregulated and we're outside of the window of tolerance, we actually lose connection to the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex literally goes offline. So we no longer have an integrated brain, a calm brain, the ability to think and feel at the same time. If we think about the functions of the prefrontal cortex, um, the prefrontal cortex is the CEO executive functioning of the brain. 
when that goes offline, we have no access to body regulation, emotional regulation, um, empathy, the ability to regulate our um, emotional experience so that we can think and feel at the same time. So it really is all about understanding the upstairs brain and the downstairs brain and its connection or coherence with the whole body or the nervous system. So this is where uh, I want to bring in polyvagal theory because it can be very confusing for us and our clients when we start to try and align the window of tolerance with, with polyvagal theory. So Steve Porges uh, revolutionised our understanding of the nervous system by teaching us about uh, the three branches of the nervous system or the vagus nerve. And he, he found this by observing uh, premature babies. So if you're interested in looking at his work, um, you can look up how he came up with the theory of uh, polyvagal theory. It's a really interesting story. But what he discovered is that the nervous system scans the environment for safety and danger. And he used the, the word neuroception, so the perception of the nervous system. And that this actually bypasses the brain. It's scanning the environment for safety and danger through the body. So it's like an alarm, um, a smoke alarm of, of the body, of the nervous system. It's taking in information from both inside the body and outside the body at the same time. And 24-7, it is scanning the environment for safety and that or danger. If the nervous system determines that we are safe or that you are safe, then the nervous system will really be able to activate the social engagement or the ventral branch of the nervous system. This is where we feel safe in our body. Our body posture demonstrates that. We're able to maintain eye contact and have facial expressions that let us know that we're safe to connect with. Um, there's a sense of homeostasis in our system where we're like that um, boat going through calm waters. We're actually in the window of tolerance when, when our nervous system determines that we are safe. If our nervous system determines that the environment or person is dangerous, this activates our sympathetic nervous system, which activates our defence strategies. And this happens within seconds. So when our nervous system determines that there is danger, we get activated into the fight, flight or mobilisation. There's high energy. We're ready to fight. We're ready to run. We're ready to take action. If our nervous system determines that there's no point running or fighting, that in fact it's pointless to take any action or to mobilise, the nervous system chooses the dorsal branch. It's an emergency state. It's a state where we believe that there's no point taking action and the smartest thing to do is to freeze or to shut down. And so our nervous system automatically determines which branch is going to be activated based on neuroception, based on nervous system interpretation of the environment. So this is what it looks like in our body. Our ventral vagal safety window of tolerance is the green where we're able to connect, we're able to feel joy, we're able to be curious, our digestive system is working, our immune response is adequate. We're able to rest and recuperate and we're able to fuel um, our vital organs and non-vital organs and there's plenty of oxytocin going on. If our sympathetic branch is activated, represented in the yellow, we see that there's um, this fight flight response that the branches are activated in our arms and legs getting us ready to fight or run. So this is where we activate fear or rage. This is where we notice we're in a state of panic, our blood pressure rises, our heart rate increases, there's a lot of adrenaline, um, there's a high circulation to vital organs. And so we see this in pupil dilation, we see this in body posture, 
It's a survival instinct activation. Then the dorsal branch we can see is the emergency state where we get numbed. There is a state of low energy, depression, uh, a sense of overwhelm, helplessness. This increases fuel storage. So there's a lot of insulin activity. It numbs pain and raises our pain threshold. And what we notice in this state when the dorsal um, branch is activated is there's a decrease in our heart rate. Uh, we have low energy. We might have low blood pressure. We have digestive problems. Our muscle tone can be affected and our temperature can be affected. We can have low temperature and a low immune response in that state. So here we have um, the overlay of Dan Siegel's window of tolerance and Steve Porges' polyvagal theory in one, one image. We have the window of tolerance, which is the ventral vagal branch, showing that uh, in this state, in nervous system state, we have relative resi resilience. We can be curious. We've got logic available to us. We're able to focus. Um, there's a sense or feeling of joy. In the fight flight uh, response, this is our sympathetic branch in the polyvagal um, approach. And there's an I don't care. It's like I'm going to run um, or I'm going to fight. And this is where we see um, rage, panic, and fear. What's important to note in all of these that when we are dysregulated, we are in survival mode. It is a survival instinct. It's an adaptive way of coping with a perceived or real threat. The hypoarousal is in polyvagal terms, the dorsal branch. And what we can see is uh, there's a real solid alignment in the window of tolerance theory and, and polyvagal theory. But then we start to see the books that are coming out by Steve Porges and Deb Dana and a lot of handouts for clients. And we see that um, in understanding polyvagal theory, they have the principle of hierarchy. So you can see that the window of tolerance is in the middle um, of this uh, graph. And that in polyvagal theory, we have ventral or the window, the window of tolerance in Dan Siegel's language at the top. And what Deb Dana is uh, teaching in, in many of her books on polyvagal theory, um, there is the principle of hierarchy. So it's a bit like an upside down traffic light. We have uh, the ventral vagal at the top, which is what we're, we're aiming to access. And the hierarchy or the ladder is that when we're in dorsal, we actually need to go through sympathetic to access ventral. So what's often underneath dorsal is the accelerator on. There's a lot of energy. If someone's in dorsal vagal activation, it's not that there's nothing going on. And that's how it can appear. They can appear low in energy, disengaged, um, collapsed, unable to communicate. But actually what's beneath that is a lot of feeling. It's actually an indication that there is so much overwhelm, so much sympathetic activation that the system has shut down. So once people move out of that dorsal, we need to be able to hold the space for all of the activation um, that will be beneath that. So there will be a great deal of fear and anger and frustration beneath dorsal vagal. So if we think about observing the body and noticing our clients or our own posture, how we can tell uh, someone is in a hyperaroused state. So we can see this in the body language, in the tone of voice. It's a high energy, hyperaroused, red zone arousal. So the sympathetic nervous system is activated and it's panic or rage. And what we know about that rage is that all of that anger is always anxiety. It's survival. So wherever there is anger, there is anxiety with it. And anxiety is the activator of that anger. 
someone in dorsal branch activation or hypoarousal, you can see it in their body posture with a collapsed posture. The shoulders are down, unable to make eye contact. Um, clients in this state may not pick up their phone, may not be engaging, may not be turning up to their appointments. Um, they may be finding it really hard to find their words. They may be feeling a sense of despair and what we know is that they're in hypoaroused activation. Their dorsal branch has been activated. And what we know about that from polyvagal theory perspective and Steve Cordes perspective is that when someone is in shutdown, we know that that's a result of extreme overwhelm of the sympathetic nervous system. Window of tolerance, we can notice that in someone's posture by their readiness to engage. The facial expressions show very clearly when someone is in a window of tolerance, they're able to maintain eye contact, they're able to smile, um, their shoulders are relaxed. There's an openness, uh, there's a sense of ease and connection, and a connection of function. So really attuning ourselves to how someone presents and what we're noticing in our colleagues, in our clients, by observing posture, it tells us a lot about what's going on in the nervous system and where energy is. We know that hyperarousal is not all wrong. So we need hyperarousal and the activation of the sympathetic nervous system sometimes to set boundaries, to say no. And so sympathetic uh, arousal is not all bad. Um, so this is really important for our clients to understand. And we know that when clients are learning to set boundaries for the first time, or if we're setting boundaries for the first time, there's going to be some anxiety about that. It's going to push us potentially outside of our window of tolerance. And for clients to know that, for them to be already thinking about what's happening in their nervous system and to have a language and an understanding of it's normal to feel really un uncomfortable when we have to assert our boundaries for the first time, if that's really unfamiliar. But to know that um, this is what's happening in their body, that their sympathetic nervous system is coming to their aid to help them to set those boundaries. We also know that the dorsal uh, vagal activation blended with ventral is essential to our sleep, to our resting and digesting, um, to our ability to stop and rest. And so we, uh, in understanding the window of tolerance and polyvagal theory, we start to understand and appreciate our own nervous system, be able to read our own nervous system and be able to attend to what we need and to rest and know that this is um, important for our survival. And if we don't take that rest, then our nervous system will force us to rest. It will shut us down. And that's what burnout is. When we're not attending to our own self-care, uh, we're ignoring the signs and symptoms that our nervous system or our body is giving us, um, then our body makes a decision for us. And uh, you can certainly see that in um, Gabor Mate's book, When the Body says no, it's a very, very good book on um, the body setting the boundaries for us when we don't set them ourselves. So one of the things that we can do in um, having conversations with our clients about the window of tolerance is to consider when we've built a relationship of trust and we have um, a really good sense of, of trust and safety with our clients, we can start to explore the history of their body, the history of their nervous system. And we might do that by exploring or getting them to um, list their positive and negative life experiences. And we might ask them to allocate um, zero to 10 in terms of no disturbance or extreme disturbance. And this is important to do in a session together so that we can uh, watch for cues of dysregulation and notice uh, when the body and the nervous system um, is activated and being able to talk about that and regulate that in the session. It's also really helpful uh, to know what their positive experiences are. 
and to um, get a sense of what happens in their body posture and tone of voice when they're talking to those things and to know um, all of the experiences that have actually brought them joy and to include that in our work and our treatment, our conversations. It can also be used with the reasons for use scale, if you're familiar with that. Uh, that starts to help clients join the dots around uh, extremely disturbing uh, experiences that they've had and how using substances may be helping them to get into the window of tolerance or getting a false sense of window of tolerance uh, as a way of regulating the nervous system. What we know uh, through Babette Rothschild's work is that when a client is dysregulated, the most important thing we can do is put on the boat. So slowing things down, lowering the bar, reducing the pressure, pausing what we're talking about and regulating so that that dysregulation can be regulated and that the clients can see that they actually have the capacity to regulate that, that pressure when they're feeling triggered or dysregulated. And exploring what are the, what are the self-soothing or co-regulating skills that actually help them to regulate. There's a lot of uh, great graphs out there that help the conversations with clients and I, I use this one a lot. Um, it's not the window of tolerance because it's the, the traffic light polyvagal uh, ventral at the bottom, but it's a great uh, graph to help clients map their own nervous system and I actually find this useful uh, for ourselves as workers to actually look at how is my nervous system? Am I uh, experiencing that social engagement or have I um, gone outside of my window of tolerance up into fight, flight or freeze? And I guess this is more accurate in terms of what's happening that we move through sympathetic activation to the freeze response. Um, and it, it's a really helpful to really get some words to describe exactly what, what's happening. In the freeze, we're feeling overwhelmed. We can't take action. In the fight flight, we are mobilised. We can take action. And in the green ventral vagal window of tolerance, the sense is I am safe. This is another overlay of if, if anyone's interested in internal family systems where uh, polyvagal theory and internal family systems have been overlaid here. So we see the window of tolerance at the bottom, resilience, uh, set the self or IFS, and I can and I am statements. So in that state, feeling a sense of flow, a sense of co-regulation, feeling safe to connect. And then you can see um, in the sympathetic and the hypo-aroused states, we see that named as survival. And, and this is really, really helpful because when we are dysregulated, it's so important that we appreciate our body is working to protect, working to help us survive something. And it's automatically coming to our aid because it has interpreted some form of danger. So what I love about this is um, the identification of the exiles, um, those vulnerable parts of self being in the survival um, part of the nervous system and that the freeze response is uh, recognition of protectors. So in IFS, there's the use of the term defenders or firefighters that the firefighters and defenders are coming to our aid to protect us um, and the firefighters can um, be in that sympathetic fixed protect mode and there's a sense of I must, I must take action, I must seek safety. In the freeze it's a sense of submit or collapse and it's all about withdrawal. I am seeking safety via disconnection. So uh, again, you can maybe relate to this 
and certainly when I'm talking to a lot of uh, workers in supervision that there is uh, a desire to disconnect that there is a sense of overwhelm we've we've had our sympathetic activation and we are feeling like withdrawing or collapsing or disconnecting in order to find safety so these are all cues of knowing what is exactly happening to my nervous system and how is it interpreting the um, environment and how is it seeking to protect me? Another one is the metaphor of freeze and fire and the window of tolerance being the sweet spot in the middle. And clients really like these metaphors. They, they relate to them. They can see that the freeze response or the hypoarousal is exactly that, freeze a frozen state, an inability to move, a numbness, and that the hyperarousal is hot. It's high activity. Um, there's a racing of thoughts and a racing um, of, of anger and emotions in, in that state. So they really relate to that. And in this um, graph, it's identifying that triggers are what activate uh, the dysregulation or the survival instinct. And I think I would I would use the word survival activation um, rather than dysregulation. We can use both words because it is it is the dysregulation. That's certainly how clients feel it and experience it, and they feel like they are out of control. But for them to understand, this is the nervous system attempt to regulate and protect in some way, even though we are dysregulated. So it's adaptive and supporting us. Uh, this one is the window between extreme weather events. And so what I like about this is it differentiates signs of distress and extreme dis distress. And that's very helpful, again, for us and for our clients to, to know how severe and extreme is the distress um, if we're looking at that on a scale. And what are the signs of that? How do I notice that in my body? What are my um, sensations or experiences? And being able to, to name that. Then there's a the metaphor of the tiger where our sympathetic nervous system is fight, flight, attacking and running from the tiger. Our freeze response is hiding. And what many of our, our clients experience is the fawn response, which is in hypoarousal, where we are begging not to be eaten. So there's a lot of people pleasing behaviour, a dis disowning of self, negating of self for the sake of the other. And then the antidote, of course, is the ventral. And, and so the additional F word there is block. Um, connecting to self and connecting to others for support and co-regulation. And this is really the gift of polyvagal theory and Steve Porges' work that has taught us our biological imperative to have co-regulation. Another great author and, and teacher in polyvagal theory is Jan Winhall, and I highly recommend her book, Treating Trauma and Addiction with the Felt Sense Polyvagal Model. I'm currently involved in consultation with Jan and she is running many courses on uh, implementing polyvagal theory into addiction work. And Jan has combined Eugene Genlon's work on focusing and combined that with polyvagal theory. So if you go to her website, you will see that she has increased our um, fight, flight, freeze to actually incorporate some other experiences. And she's found this through working with clients and exploring polyvagal theory with clients. She also has a client version of this. But you'll see that she's very importantly pointed out that when we have sympathetic and ventral blending, this is where we're able to play. There's a mobilization. So whenever there's movement, wherever there's joy, it's a combination of ventral and sympathetic nervous system. And likewise, when we experience rest and stillness, it's a combination of ventral and dorsal. And so she has put addiction as a combination of dorsal and sympathetic. So the activation of our survival instincts uh, being a contributor 
to dorsal. What I really like about this graph is she's also incorporated attachment theory as well. So she's really um, brought in a number of different theories and integrated that. Jan has also on her website got body cards and I use this with my clients and um, sometimes supervisees and use this myself. So again, the dual lens of ourselves as human beings with a nervous system, knowing you know what does it look like and feel like when I'm in ventral? What does it look like and feel like when I'm in dorsal activation? What does it look like and feel like when I'm in sympathetic activation? What are the thoughts I have? What are the memories that have been triggered? What does that look like in terms of colour and shape? So clients really like this. It really helps them to get to know their own nervous system and to start to feel and experience through this, this artwork what it feels like in their body and where it is they feel it when they're in the safe uh, ventral vagal activation and when they're in dysregulated states. So um, as Jan has pointed out, it's a combination of Eugene Denlin's work and Steve Porges' work in her felt sense experiencing. And what's important in, in this work, um, in bringing polyvagal and the window of tolerance into our work, is really appreciating that the essence of working with another person is to be fully present to them as a living being. So our ventral vagal presence regulates clients when they're dysregulated. If we think about the nervous system talking to nervous systems, our presence of ventral is being able to be an anchor for the person who's dysregulated by being with or having co-regulation. And as Steve Porges pointed out, when we understand the nervous system and we understand the context or the story of the behaviour, we see that these are adaptive bodily responses that are not bad behaviours, no matter how risky or um, bizarre they may be to us that if we understand the function of behaviour, we start to see that the body is always working to our survival. And often uh, these functions are heroic when we understand the content. So uh, as I have um, advertised, this is also an opportunity for us to think about psychological safety here. So exactly what I've just said, nervous systems talk to nervous systems. And we need cultures of safety. We need to work in cultures of safety. We need to know that there's um, respect and safety around us. So for our clients, I'm sorry, my slides just moved then. Uh, for our clients, if our clients feel unsafe, if they're angry, if they're feeling despairing, we can often feel that because our nervous system is using neuroception to interpret their behaviour and we start to get dysregulated. And that is also true um, of our context. So if we are feeling um, that we're in a, an organisation that's punitive or that's stuck or missionless or crisis driven, which we know in the pandemic, there's a lot of rapid changes, there's a lot of um, infrastructure challenges. Uh, it's important that we understand the importance of culture. So for leadership um, to understand the nervous system and be considering psychological safety as a way of regulating our nervous system in order for us to be in ventral activation for our clients because nervous systems talk to nervous systems. If we think about the principles of trauma-informed care, it's all about safety. It's all about uh, creating trustworthiness and transparency, um, having collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, choice and voice. So this is important in our culture to have psychological safety for us. We need to um, have an organisational culture that's observing the principles of trauma-informed care and also thinking about psychological safety in the culture of the workforce, in the culture of the team. So psychological safety is high level of trust uh, that has 
the ability to feel included. So I have inclusion safety. I am welcome. I belong. Uh, it's the ability to learn. I am safe to learn in this culture. It's safe to say, I don't know. It's safe to say, I've made a mistake. So a psychologically safe environment puts our nervous system at ease. It lets us know that there's a safe holding space if we're not um, knowing something or we need to uh, learn something new or we need to talk about a mistake that we've made. We need to know that it's safe to do that. Psychological safety includes contributor safety. So we need to feel safe to contribute, to have a voice, to collaborate, to be consulted, to be included in decision making. And this helps uh, our nervous system to feel at ease. If things are unpredictable and we have no knowledge of what's going on and there's poor communication, we're more likely to get dysregulated and move out of our window of tolerance. So we need to know that it's safe to ask questions, it's safe to uh, contribute our ideas to solutions. And we need to know that it's safe to challenge the status quo. There's a lot of things that happen on the front line um, that is removed from higher levels of the organisation. And so the ability for frontline to start to talk about some of those challenges and to contribute to um, pointing out solutions is really critical to psychologically safe cultures and, and teams and environments. One of the things I've been doing with a number of teams is thinking about culture, thinking about collaboration and doing that through getting an agreement uh, or commitment to what is the culture we want to create here? How, how do we create uh, a power with culture and not a power over culture? Because all of our nervous systems need that right now. So an activity such as creating an above the line and below the line um, mapping exercise that gets the, the team to agree what is above the line behaviour and attitudes, what's below the line and getting some predictability. What, what can we um, commit to? What can we be certain of? And also appreciating in this the power of co-regulation. So as I said, it's a biological imperative. We're wired for social connection. There's incredible isolation right now. And nervous systems um, are smoke alarms picking up danger and safety in our environment. So now more than ever, we need to know we have safe landing pads we need to know there's backup, there's support, there's collaboration, there's consistency, there's kindness, and there's clarity around um, our environment and our culture. So if we think about the nervous system and apply that to ourselves, one of the things that, that I do daily and I encourage um, staff to do is to really stop every day, throughout the day, to stop, pause, check in and ask, how is my nervous system? To take out one of those maps um, of the window of tolerance or polyvagal theory that you relate to and to check in, am I in the window of tolerance? Am I hyper or hypo aroused? What is it that I feel? So we know to name our emotions really helps us to take charge. To ask ourselves how our energy level is. Is our energy up, hyper, manic? or are we actually uh, low in energy? And what does my nervous system need right now is a really important uh, question to be asking ourselves. The other helpful tools to help us keep an eye on our nervous system is to check um, our emotions. As I said, name it to tame it. What is it that we're feeling? We may feel many things at the same time. Um, what's challenging? Bringing curiosity and compassion to ourselves and really understanding our energy levels, as I said. This is another um, polyvagal chat, chart map that I like to use and I like it because it also talks about uh, what's going on in the body. So we have um, the social engagement, the sympathetic and freeze, but then on up to the side, we have what's happening in terms of the body so our insulin is increasing and our heart rate it can be decreasing. Um, in ventral we have digestion, 
uh, resistance to infection and in, in immune response. So you see all of the benefits of having a calm nervous system is really um, impacting our health and well-being and helping our ability to recuperate. And with all the sickness that's around, uh, I do wonder if our immune systems are being impacted because our nervous system uh, is really being stretched and, and, and under pressure right now. So some grounding techniques for ourselves and our clients uh, to notice our body. We forget our body often. We don't eat when we're hungry. We don't sleep well when we're tired. We don't rest. So stopping to breathe is, is one of the greatest things we can do for our nervous system. Breath can be activating for some clients. So if you're doing this with clients, really noticing how they're responding to taking in a deep breath. But slowing the breath down, feeling our feet on the floor, noticing the earth beneath us, the chair supporting us, or the bed if we're lying down, and just stopping to breathe and noticing where our breath is, where it's noticeable in our muscles, in our rise and fall of the chest, in the rise and fall of the belly, and just noticing that, dropping the shoulders letting the muscles in our eyes and our face relax and just feeling what it's like to stop and breathe. The other thing that will support our and befriend our nervous system is to stay close to our own power. Really know what we have choice about, um, to look for cues of safety in the room, to support ourselves with um, allies and friends, for co-regulation, to really think about what power do we have and what power can we claim in order to keep our nervous system well and in the window of pain. And the last activity for grounding that I really like to use with, with clients is left hand on heart, right hand on belly, taking a breath and noticing um, the act of kindness as we place our own hand as a befriending activity to our nervous system and just feeling what that's like to self-soothe. Self-soothing is an instinctive behaviour. Um, befriending our body, listening to our own wise guide within, listening to the felt sense and the nervous system as a messenger is really important in our self-care. And we know for clients, as I said, um, there's the use of substances to, to self-soothe. So if they're in hyper-arousal, they're probably using alcohol and cannabis and, and um, the depressant type drugs to calm, to get that window of tolerance feeling. It's artificial and it doesn't last. Um, but there is that sense of self-soothing or self-regulation in that uh, behaviour. And equally, if they're in dorsal vagal activation, then stimulants can be uh, really attractive to help give them that false sense of mobilisation or activation that they need. So getting to know our own uh, body, our own nervous system, finding self-soothing activities, noticing what we need and attending to that. All of these um, Activities are what we call ventral hacks. So the breathing, the playing, spending time if we're parents with children playing, uh, Tai Chi, Qigong, slow rhythmic movement, yoga, trauma-informed yoga is, is extremely good for uh, clients who have a trauma history, dancing, walking in nature, doing a ventral vagal playlist. So all of the songs that uplift you, or that help you feel safe and calm, getting a playlist and listening to that. Using aromatherapy, blowing bubbles, spending time with friends and socialising where we can are all ways of activating the ventral, ventral branch. So this is all about being embodied. The window of tolerance is really bringing attention to our body, bringing us out of our mind, 
appreciating the bi-directional super highway of our mind body and realising that our life can only be lived when we're fully present to our whole selves, helping our clients to do that, get a language for that, and doing that for ourselves um, is, is a great gift of healing. So now we're uh, open to questions. Thank you. Yeah, shortly that'd be great. Thank you. Um, we've got a few questions, Jen. We're probably not going to get to all of them. Um, first one, I'm interested to know if there's a specialist in this area that we could refer clients to help them learn and understand this theory about what is happening to them. Uh, I feel there is such an emphasis on medicating people that this is getting overlooked. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, in terms of referral, the first thing I would say is learn more about this and get really good at it because it's not that challenging and really getting a good understanding of, of polyvagal theory and window of tolerance. There's lots of very simple ways of having these conversations with clients that makes a huge difference to clients because it's empowering them. It's giving them knowledge about their own body. So I would say research it and, 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 and we'll, I'll be giving you lots of resources after uh, this session for you to do your own reading. But in terms of referral, any somatic experiencing therapist who um, advertises that they are using polyvagal theory, um, they're incorporating the body and they would have good understanding of the body. Um, as we've had a webinar in the past with OTs doing sensory uh, profiling, sensory modulation, an OT um, can be very helpful in a client getting a profile of their sensory needs and using that to actually modulate or, or uh, attend to their sensations as a way of regulating themselves in their window of tolerance. They're the two things that come to mind for that question. Thank you very much. And that's a good reminder about the other webinars that we have on the Turning Point website. Next question, how can we apply this with clients who report that they continually hyper aroused hypo arouse but always present well in session or put on a front without intending to? Yeah, so uh, that's their survival instinct. And so what we know is, you know, presenting well, protecting um, image and, and expressing vulnerability in front of another person can be extremely anxiety provoking and distressing. And if they've had no template for that in their family of origin or history that can be really hard. They think that they have to present well. But I would be using the, the body cards to get them to explore what actually happens for them, giving them the information. My, my rule of thumb is to educate the clients with everything I know about these theories um, in ways that are pal palatable for them in, in language that they understand. You know your own clients best um, so that they can be educated about their own own biology and they can do that through um, the artwork on the body cards. They can get a sense of when they're in hyperarousal, when they're in hyperarousal and what are the things that support them. Um, there's some great um, uh, strategies of what, what was I going to say, um, some uh, tools from St Luke's, so the body signals cards from St Luke's um, there's also a set of cards on self-soothing for trauma. So getting a repertoire of self-soothing activities and trying them on or experimenting to see what works. There's no one size fits all for someone in hyperarousal or hypoarousal. It's very individual. Um, so it's exploring what, what capacity can they um, develop through resource. So we use the term resourcing the client by exploring their self-soothing strategies, seeing what worked, um, and then gathering a repertoire themselves so that they start to create their own self-soothing um, plan or kit. Thank you. Uh, just, I, th I think we've got time for one more. Mm -hmm. um, apologies to everyone that we didn't get to your question. And I noticed there's a, quite a number of questions coming through now. I'll try and respond as best I can. Okay, Jen, final question. How do we differentiate body responses for those exposed to complex trauma, uh, specific to those who may have an undiagnosed neurological disorder? Mm. Well, that's outside of my skill set. 
I guess I work with what's in the room. If, if there's hyperarousal or hypoarousal, I'm working to regulate that. And if, if we're finding that there is not the capacity to um, use all the strategies of somatic experiencing and, and um, sensory modulation, that there could be something organic going on preventing that and that, that um, we probably need a specialist in, in that area to really help uh, guide you in terms of what's possible to know really what the capacity is um, to bring in some regulation strategies. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to sneak one last one in because um, this is probably quick to answer. Um, are you aware of any good YouTube videos that clients could watch? Sure, um, there are quite a few. If you Google window of tolerance or polyvagal theory, there's quite a few cartoon type um, videos. I would always watch the video first to make sure it, because uh, there's lots on YouTube and Google. So just check them out yourselves. But um, certainly feel free to email me if you have further questions and I can answer in an email. I can send you resources or um, video YouTube links that I use with, with my clients. But if you've got a good relationship with the client, the best way of educating the client is for you to actually have that conversation with them yourself um, and then maybe send them a YouTube link between sessions uh, can be very useful. There's a lot out there. Mm. Thank you, Jen. I might get you to move to the, the slide with the QR code. Mm -hmm. um, so if people could spend the time uh, filling out the evaluation server, they'd be really appreciated. Um, for those that you are asking, the slides are not available, but Jen's going to provide us with lots of handouts and the webinar will always be available on the Turning Point website. Jen, thanks again for coming back um, and for such a wonderful presentation yet again. And thank you to everyone for attending. Thanks very much for the opportunity and feel free to contact if you have further questions that we haven't been able to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Jen.